My name is Geneviève Zubrzycki. I'm director of the Copernicus program in Polish studies in the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies at the University of Michigan. And tonight I have the pleasure to welcome students, faculty, and members of the community to this special event. I would like also to extend uh, a special welcome to distinguished guests in the audience, Ambassador Ron Weiser and his wife Eileen, and Alison A. Dean, Andrew Martin. Dariusz Stola is director of the Polin Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw, which opened its doors last October. He's also professor of history at the Institute of Political Studies at the Polish, Pol Polish Academy of Sciences and a fellow at the Center for Migration Research at Warsaw University. He has published eight books and over 100 articles on international migrations in the 20th century, the communist regime in Poland, Polish-Jewish relations and the Holocaust, as well as on Polish debates about these various pasts. We're extremely pleased to host him in Ann Arbor for a couple of days and honored to have him present to us the museum, an institution in the making for 20 years, an ambitious collaborative project funded by the city of Warsaw, the Polish government, and private donors from Poland and abroad. The museum's core exhibition was created by an international team of experts and tells the very important story of 1,000 years of Jewish life in Poland, its tragic destruction during the Holocaust, but also its resilient survival and renewal today. Finally, I'd like to mention that Professor Stola's lecture tonight is part of an ongoing Polish-Jewish series um, co-sponsored by the Copernicus Program in Polish Studies and the Franco Frankel Center uh, for Judaic Studies. But it is the first event marking the affiliation between the University of Michigan and Polin, the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. Last summer, Polish Studies signed an official affiliation with the museum to facilitate collaboration on research exchanges for faculty, and pedagogic activities for U of M students. So we very much look forward to working with the museum for many years to come. And thank Professor Stola for coming all the way from Warsaw to Ann Arbor. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Stola. Thank you very much, Geneviève. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm grateful uh, to the and uh, program to the Frankel Center for bringing you here to the place which I have already been several years ago, a place where I have a number of friends. And what is important, I had friends before I became the director, because now the number of my friends has been growing recently. Uh, not to take too much time, uh, the muse I'm going to talk about is much more interesting than, than, than me. Uh, Genevieve has already mentioned some key basic features of it. I would like to tell you and show you um, um, uh, what is it. And still, please remember, or don't trust me fully, I would prefer you to come personally and verify if what I say is true. That means to see the museum by, by yourself. Uh, uh, beginning with the architecture, as you can see, is, uh, oh, sorry. is our uh, great western window uh, in a building designed by a Finnish architect previously completely known in Poland, Mr. Rainer Malamaki, who nevertheless won the competition against very big names in architecture, like Daniel Liebeskind, by proposing something which is modest when seen from outside, but beautiful within. And I think the building which promises less than it delivers also conveys well our way of thinking that also the core exhibition delivers more than, than we can promise. Uh, it began with a place, this place, uh, this square in northwestern Warsaw, in the Moranov district of Warsaw, you can see rather nondescript residential buildings from the early 1960s. Uh, no old buildings, and not incidentally. And a huge, well, huge, relatively big park, plus this object, which you may not recognize from a distance, but you will recognize in a second, because it commemorates two different worlds. First, the biggest Jewish city in Europe, and if not for mass immigration to North America, it would have been the biggest Jewish city in the world. 
next to the place where the museum stands was the heart of the Jewish Warsaw, the Nalewki Street, Franciszkańska Street, Gęsia Street, and this is where we are in the Warsaw of 1930s. Uh, the biggest concentration of synagogues and houses of prayer in the world, of Jewish synagogues and houses of prayer in the world at the time, bigger than in New York. And then the same place in 1945. Actually, almost nothing remained. There were a few buildings in the very distant parts of the ghetto. The central part of the former ghetto was completely destroyed by the Germans uh, during and after the uprising in the ghetto in, in the spring of 1943. So this is what the few survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto who returned to Warsaw, this is what they, what they saw in, 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 the, in the former had the biggest Jewish city in, in Europe. So this, this past, the, the place itself has been Asset, a key value, a key point of reference for the construction of the music. I'm not sure this microphone works perfectly. Uh, so how did it begin? First, a few words, because the fact that there is this museum for me is a is a kind of miracle. It shouldn't be there. The likelihood of it becoming reality was very low. And myself, I was among the skeptics 10 years ago, after 10 years of discussions, talking about the museum, when nothing was materializing, I, I thought, well, okay, it will never happen. But it did happen. It happened first thanks to a group of people in the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute. Some 21 years ago, a, a group of my colleagues, historians from the Jewish Historical Institute, went for the opening of the uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. And they were very much impressed by the museum, but also they went back disturbed. Uh, and as they said, they were disturbed because the Jews appear on the scene in the Holocaust Museums only to be killed in this last moment before the genocide. And second, that in a museum which focus on the on, on, on a genocide, the agency is largely with the perpetrators. And they decided that we must have a museum of Jewish life in Poland, life before the Holocaust. Then there was not yet the question about the life after the Holocaust. So this is, this is the most important group, and, but this is just an association, a non-governmental organization, which nevertheless managed to form a public-private partnership with the Ministry of Culture, the city of Warsaw. And this triangle, made the museum. And they divided the work very wisely. Namely, the city and the ministry promised to build the building. The city gave the land. The, the ministry and the city paid for the building. While the association was responsible for uh, the concept and the production of the core exhibition. And that was wise because, as you know, politicians are very good, helpful people. They, they want to help. And this way, they were somehow uh, a little bit distant from the making of the core exhibition, which was left into the hands of historians, historians and curators. And a large and a very international group of historians, probably half of them from Poland, half of them from Israel, Western Europe, North America, primarily North America, uh, did it, uh, led by a distinguished leadership, uh, incredible intellectual vitality of Professor Barbara Kirschendlat Gimblet. Uh, uh, there is a saying in Polish that you may have many fathers, but mother is only one. So this is Barbara Kirschendlat Gimblet. And uh, this is during the construction works. Uh, it went relatively smooth for a big public investment. Uh, uh, public investment in Poland have the best pre uh, press, but it went relatively smooth. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, you can see it uh, filling gradually the square in front of the monument of the ghetto fighters. And this is, as you see, the key relationship, spatially, is between the new building and the monument designed by Rapoport and unveiled back in 1948. It was the second monument of the uh, Warsaw Ghetto. There is another one, much smaller, hidden here in the, uh, be behind the trees. And Malamaki, the, the Finnish architect, won the competition against really big names and great designs by other architects because he combined in this building two contradictory features. Namely, when you approach the building from outside, it's simple. It's a big box. I would say it, it is modest. It's not very expressive. Why is it important? Because it does not dominate the monument. It's clear all the time that the monument is more important than the building of the museum. But when you enter it, you see this. This is our main lobby. It's a huge space, kind of organic shape, which uh, almost all our visitors immediately realize that this must have a meaning. 
is not just a beautiful strange space. It must have a meaning and they interpret it in different ways. I have heard a dozen different interpretations. The original one by Malamaki was that this is the Red Sea departing when the Jews were leaving Egypt. Uh, I have my own, which is the color of these walls. It's a very warm yellow, it looks like a yellow stone. Uh, it's not a color of, of rocks you find in Poland, but it resembles very much the color of the canyons in the Judean desert. So for me, it's a symbol of a civilization brought from the Near East into this northern country of pine trees, potatoes, and long winters. And what emerged out of this combination, out of this transpla transplantation of a civilization to another climate. So the beauty of this, the beauty of this uh, main lobby is somehow hidden in a simple box of the building. It does not dominate it. And it surprises almost everyone. And it also conveys an important message. It's architecturally very different to the Holocaust museums. And when you enter it, you immediately realize that this is not a Holocaust museum. And this is a challenge, because by, by the research we have made and research of others, most of the people in Poland, in Western Europe, and elsewhere, the only thing they know about the history of Polish Jews is the Holocaust. And that's it. They know nothing or almost nothing, including Polish students, they know very little about it. And they are surprised how much history there is. Uh, some data about the museum, as you see, is quite large, 18,000 square feet, and the core exhibition takes only about 40% of it. And I stress it because this museum is much more than a museum. Like when you have a kind of a 19th century idea of a museum, a uh, building looking like a shrine in the middle of the city with some old objects in, in glass boxes, it is not. It is a cultural center and an educational center. And what is important, it had been a cultural center before the construction of the building. During the construction, we've made an ochel, a tent of a very strange shape, similar to the shape of the lobby, which was a, a, a venue for concerts, uh, temporary exhibitions, public discussions on various topics. So even before the core exhibition is, was opened, when we made the, um, um, uh, a poll, a sociological research in Greater Warsaw, 70% of the respondents already knew about the museum before the core exhibition was opened. So I think that was a great idea to start the operation of the museum before the building was, the building was completed. And as you see, Educational Center, uh, uh, until recently it was it was the biggest department uh, in, in terms of staff. Now when we have opened the core exhibition, we have many docents and guides and so on, because uh, education is a priority. And it seems not only a priority, there is a demand for this particular education that we provide. And we have a nice auditorium which fits equally well a, a Philharmonic Orchestra or a rock band, and I will show it, and another, some other functions that are necessary for a modern museum. So you can see, for example, this is our temporary exhibition, which we had had before the opening of the core exhibition on the Jewish Warsaw, uh, uh, Warszawa Warsze. Uh, it had some 30,000 visitors, which for Warsaw is, is, is very good. And indeed, uh, Warsawians, it turned out that Warsawians loved to learn about the Jewish past of the city, that there is kind of a demand for a new identity of being a citizen of Warsaw, uh, which, which seems a novelty after many years of the communist regime when no such things existed. There was only identity, a national identity, and a family, uh, maybe, maybe religious identity as well. This is our auditorium with a Philharmonic Orchestra. We have quite regularly concerts by Philharmonic Orchestra. We have a whole series of performances by famous Polish Jewish composers, and there was a, quite a number of them. I was actually surprised how many of them there have been. Uh, all rock bands. This particular is the Bund Band, a tribute to the Bundes, to the uh, Marek Edelman, the leader of the, of the Jewish Socialist Party and the fighter in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, by the way, uh, you may have noticed this yellow flower. This is a daffodil. Uh, yesterday, April 19, we had the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And for the third time, we, the volunteers of the museum were distributing these yellow daffodils in Warsaw, and this year also in other cities. And uh, last year, it started with less than 100 volunteers. Last year, we had 400 volunteers. This year, we had 800 volunteers. We have distributed 50,000 of these flowers. And to tell you why, why daffodils, 
Back in the 1980s, Marek Edelman, who was one of the leaders of the opposition against the communist dictatorship, organized parallel uh, commemoration of the Ghetto Uprising, because the Communist Party did commemorate the Ghetto Uprising, interpreting it as the Jewish proletarian fighting against fascist regimes. Back in the 50s, they were fasc actually fighting against President Truman, if you look back at, at ceremonies. Uh, uh, and the, the earliest flowers, the flowers that bloom early in Poland are daffodils. So he was bringing these flowers, and a couple of years ago, a, a, a very creative designer designed this yellow daffodil, which when you unfold it, it is a Star of David, which actually has another reference, namely in many Polish cities during the war, Germans imposed armbands or yellow Stars of David as a Jewish badge, as, as a sign of, of people being Jewish. So uh, I've just got a report that we had media coverage in national television and all major newspapers, plus 800 volunteers, usually uh, 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 kids from secondary schools who do it. Uh, let me add, last year, April 19 was uh, was the Easter Saturday, uh, like in 1943. Uh, I know this day, uh, it, it was a challenge for us because there's less people in the streets. But Polish Catholics go to the church on this morning with baskets with food. So I went to our bishop, Bishop Nietzsche, and asked him, could our volunteers stand in front of the churches and distribute these flowers? And he said, yes, sure. And he wrote a letter to, to the parishes, please allow this. this. So it, now you can imagine 30,000 Polish Catholics wearing a Star of David on Easter, and this is what happened last year. One of many miracles. So th that was the tribute to Marek Edelman exactly two years ago, the first time when we had that. Uh, or we have distinguished speakers. This gentleman is Professor Hanno Gutfreund, a former president of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, he speaks fluent Polish, although his lecture on Einstein and Polish physicists was, was in English. Uh, he was great. I un almost understood the relativity theory in 15 minutes. <laughs> Uh, and now we move to October, uh, last year, October 28, the opening of the core exhibition. Uh, please let me note that between the opening of the building, which was April 9, to, uh, 2013, and the opening of the core exhibition, uh, there was 18 months when we were a museum without a museum. And we had 400,000 visitors. People who came to see this beautiful building, to, to listen to the concerts, to see temporary exhibitions and so on. I think it's quite remarkable to have a museum without an exhibition attracting 400,000 people. And this is the opening. You can see Poland's president, Mr. Komorowski. You can see Israel's president, Mr. Rivlin, and the first ladies. Um, uh, actually, former Polish prime minister, the president Polish prime minister, 30-something uh, ambassadors, uh, and a crowd of other people. But the politicians were not the people who opened the core exhibition. The core exhibition was opened by this couple, Marian Turski, uh, the chairman of the board of the museum, Auschwitz survivor, uh, and Joasia Widwa, a student of the Jewish school in Warsaw. So two generations of Polish Jews opened the core exhibition. And Marian Turski speaking, he quoted a, a, a partisan song in Yiddish, we are here. Uh, the history we are telling has not ended. It has changed dramatically, but it has not ended. Uh, this is the evening concert that we had after the official opening. Uh, we had a, a, an opener concert. We were blessed by nice weather, so several thousand people participated, and another 25,000 was watching it on YouTube. You can see it on YouTube, it's still there, with beautiful projections on, on, on the museum, museum wall. And this is what happened afterwards. In the eight following weeks, eight weeks following the, the opening of the core exhibition, we have gathered 4,000 press clippings from Poland and all around the world. And, and this is beyond our wildest expectations. From Poland, we have some 3,000 from international press, and this is only from the countries where we did monitoring, where we bought monitoring services, which is Western Europe, Israel, uh, uh, United States of America. And among these 4,000 press clippings or notations from TV stations and the major internet portals, I have found five critical, okay? Five, which is a 0 0.000% of, of the press coverage, which was generally between very good to enthusiastic. I, I never expected an exhibition on Polish Jewish history, which is not the most funny topic you can imagine, to attract so much praise. And uh, so you, you can see the, the front pages 
of Polish, uh, West European, Israeli newspapers, not just making a small note. We had full page articles in The Economist, in the Zuddeutsche Zeitung, in the, the Guardian, and in all Polish newspapers, actually. I don't know any single Polish newspaper that didn't cover. Uh, when I was in, in Germany several weeks later, I found that the local German newspaper, Osnabrück, had a full page article on the museum. So the, it attracted a lot of attention, which we are, now we are trying to understand it. What made so many people in so different countries interested and so praiseful of the, of the museum? Maybe it's good. So here you have uh, the rest of it. Uh, and now a few words about the core exhibition. What kind of story do we tell? First, uh, this is a narrative museum, which means the core exhibition is not centered around objects and glass boxes. We tell a story and we illustrate the story with artifacts, quotations, uh, reproductions, obje objects that were restored, uh, and a lot of multimedia. Uh, uh, we have some 250 computers controlling the multimedia in the core exhibition, which is a challenge for me as, as the manager. And we start, uh, this is our, actually we start with a legend. We start with a legend which was recorded by Yiddish writers back in the 19th century, but it tells about the origin of the Jewish presence in Poland. So the legend says that a long time ago, once upon a time, when Jews were escaping persecution in Western Europe, they reached forest in Eastern Europe, and in the forest they hear a voice from heavens, another version says they found slips of paper, which says, Pauline, do shall rest here in Hebrew. Well, as a skeptical historian, I suppose they misheard the name Polanie, a Slavic tribe which established the Polish state back in the, in, the, in the ninth century. But the legend is beautiful because what is expressed, it's not a historical source. This is a historical source about the state of mind of the people who were telling the legend in the 18th and 19th century and who believed that Jewish presence in Poland is very long and permanent. They saw it as their home. Uh, the first historical hero that we show, this gentleman, is Ibrahim Nim a person known to each Polish child in each elementary school. Why? Because he made the first historical record of the Polish state. He was a merchant from Cordoba in Spain on a trade and intelligence mission to Eastern Europe. And he was writing reports to his king. And in one of the reports, he described the strange country of Prince Mieszko, uh, with strange customs and long winters and so on. Uh, and he was Jewish, he was a Jewish trade, tradesman. Uh, but what is interesting, he was writing the reports, so the first historical records on Poland is written by a Jew in Arabic, because the king was a Muslim Arab. Muslims were ruling uh, Iberia at that time. So we, and then we continue this way of presentation we quote very often original sources, always in the original language. We believe that sources, quotations from the past, are like relics found by the archaeologists. They are precious. So we show them in the original language, and then we translate it into Polish and English always. It's a bilingual museum. There were debates, should we translate it into Hebrew and Yiddish and so on, but for the economy of space, it was not possible, so we have it in the audio guides. And then we explain the story. In this case, this is the travel of of Ibrahim and Jacob into early medieval Poland. And you continue through the medieval gallery where we are trying parallelly several stories. The historical narrative of how first Jews arrived to Poland, what they did, how they settled, uh, what was their relations with the monarch, which was the key relation, how they contributed to the urbanization of Poland, because the, the massive presence of Jews coincided with the expansion of, of medieval towns. But we also need to introduce the visitor into what is a Jew? Who is a Jew? What is Judaism? We assume a very limited knowledge of the visitors, and rightly so. I mean, the, 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 the reality confirms the assumption that, especially young people, Polish, Israeli, West European, have very limited knowledge of the past. They have, I'll say, they have fragmentary knowledge. There is no general picture that they may have, so we must explain a lot of it. And for this reason, we use multimedia, uh, you have so-called layer one, the most important messages. They are objects, pictures, quotations on the wall. And then you can read in smaller fonts and then the smallest fonts, the explanation, the museum voice, what you explain about it. And then you can go to multimedia and learn uh, really a lot because in the multimedia we have thousands of pages and pictures explaining it. And then we move to the next gallery, which we call Paradisus Judorum. It tells about a different Poland. 
And Poland united with Lithuania, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, one of the biggest states in Europe at that time, and incidentally, the home of the biggest Jewish community in the world at that time, actually the home of most of all the Jews in the world at that time. In the 18th century, some 750, maybe 800, maybe even more thousand Jews lived in Poland, and that made certainly the biggest Jewish community in the world and probably also most of all the Jews in the world. So if there was a Jewish country between ancient Israel and 1948, that was this country, which is much bigger than Poland today. Poland today is about of this size. And we have relatively accurate data. All these little icons, dots, are Jewish communities, Jewish settlements. We know it because there was a tax census in the 18th century where each and every Jewish family was recorded. The only problem for estimates is how big were the Jewish families. So hence, we don't know exactly how big in Poland, but we know that that was a lot, about 800,000 people. Uh, and also what is interesting that uh, the biggest concentration is not the central Poland of today, but today's Western Ukraine, uh, from where our uh, most important exhibit comes. And uh, here you can see uh, our narrative strategy. We give the quotations in the original languages. It may be Hebrew or Latin. We have some, a dozen of languages, very different, including the Arabic one, which you have seen. And then we translate it. Uh, the name Paradisus Iudorum comes from a pamphlet. 17th century pamphlet of a nobleman who complained that Poland is a paradise for the Jews, a purgatory for the noblemen, and a hell for the peasants. Well, it certainly was a hell for the peasants. That was the, that was the bottom of the social stratification. As per the Jews, it was his misperception. But in relative terms, certainly, the legal and economic conditions of Jews in Poland were much better than, let's say, in the Central European German states, not to speak about many European states where Jewish presence did not last 1,000 years. When people ask me what was the most important period in the history of Polish Jews, the answer is very simple, 1,000 years, which is not the case in Spain, from where the Jews were evicted in the 15th century, it's not the case in England, it's not the case in France, it's not the case in many of the German states, it's the case in Poland. 1,000 years of uninterrupted presence, including through more than 200 years, the biggest Jewish community in the world. Uh, here, uh, the Paradisus Judorum Gallery is not only uh, about a, a special place for Jews, but the incredible flourishing of the Jewish culture, especially in the 16th, 17th, after the mid 17th century. And this we show by the history of Jewish print and the emergence of the rabbinical authority, the great Polish rabbis who became authoritative for the rest of Europe, especially the Ashkenazi community, uh, including uh, 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 Rabbi Moses Isel as the great rabbi from Krakow, who remains authority to the present. His commentaries, his, his great, his job of codification of the, of, the, of the religious law to the present. And again, for those visitors who just have a limited time, they just walk, will leave an impression. They will remember that there were some great rabbis. Those who want to learn more can go deep and read about Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. We have high tech, we have low tech. This is a cartoon uh, about it. And here, uh, Barbara Kish and Blad Gimblet always stress it. We have the story of certain Rivka who dared to challenge the, the rabbis. He dared to interpret Talmud in her own way, which is rather unusual for a very patriarchal community of the, of the 16th century. And then we move to the next gallery, which we call the Shtetl, Jewish town, to see the biggest, probably the most beautiful exhibit. This is the reconstruction of the ceiling of the wooden synagogue of Gwoździec, a little town now in Ukraine. Uh, I've been there last year in the middle of nowhere, really. Uh, there were some 200 wooden synagogues in old Poland. None of them survived. Uh, but what survived was documentation. Uh, in the interwar period, a group of Polish architects made a lot of photographs, drawing. Uh, so we had documentation. The, the only problem was the photographs were black and white. And only for a couple of synagogues, we had colorful drawings showing the colors of the paintings. And this is why you selected Gwoździec. And then came a miracle. Actually, the, the history of the building of this museum is full of miracles. When people ask me if I believe in miracles, I say, no, I rely on them. <laughs> So the miracle back then was that uh, the, 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 when the curatorial group was discussing you know, how, which synagogue to reconstruct, how to make it, uh, uh, 
uh, Barbara incidentally went to New York for a conference and met with a group of people from a handhouse studio from the, from the East Coast in this country, who incidentally at the same time were reconstructing the Bima from the same synagogue without any prior communication. And they had the knowledge because they trained students in restoration of the lost objects. And they thought that there is, that in Japan they have a different strategy or a different method of conservation of, of, of historical monuments. They have a lot of wooden architecture which cannot last 700 years and they have shrines that have 800, 900 years. So what they do, in every generation they dismantle them and build again. What they preserve is the knowledge of how to make it. So this is what we did. We took 200 young people from nine countries, sent them to the master campenters who are building now wooden construction in several places, and especially in southern Poland, where Germans did burn the synagogues, but they didn't burn the churches. And these churches had been built by the same craftsmen that, were, that had been building the synagogues. You know, a Jewish client or an Orthodox client or a Catholic client was a client. Uh, so, uh, thanks to, thanks to uh, uh, Irene Pletka, an Australian, uh, her parents managed to escape from Poland in September 1939 and she generously offered more than one million dollars for this project. It took them two years because they used the technology from the 17th century. No electric tools, everything by hand, no nails. They did it by the best of our knowledge how it had been made back in the 17th century. And the paints are younger. The receipt for, the pa pa for painting is from the 18th century because that is, this is when the, this, this paintings were made as we know them from photographs and, and drawings. And again, if someone wants to understand the Hebrew blessings here or the meaning of the animals, there are multimedia to, to, to explore and, and discover. Okay, there is much more. I'm just showing you a few highlights of it because otherwise, usually in a two-hour visit, our visitors can absorb between three and five percent of the content, uh, which is a lot. Uh, the next gallery shows, I think it shows very well that the, his, the general history of Poland is not just the context of the Jewish history. It's much more. They are intertwined. You cannot separate them. This is, in this gallery, we show the partitions of Poland in the late 18th century. The Polish state disappeared from maps for another 120, more, even more than 120 years. But why does it matter for the Jews? Because Polish Jews lost the legal status they had had for the past 500 years. Actually, last year, we had the 750th anniversary of the Statue of Kalisz, a document issued by Boleslas de Pius in 1264 which was a kind of a constitution for Jewish life in Poland. It was mostly economic rights, that they could move freely, trade, offer financial services, and some specific clauses. For example, that no one could accuse the Jews of the blood libel without having Jewish witnesses. So already in the 13th century, Polish monarchs knew about the blood libel and tried to prevent, uh, prevent, prevent it, which, by the way, it shows also the persistence of the prejudice because the last case of the effective use of this prejudice is Kielce, 1946, the last pogrom in Poland, where it, which started with the blood libel. So the Jews lost this legal status as a community because it was not only the biggest Jewish community, it had in its autonomy. Shlomo Avineri, one of the greatest uh, Israeli political scientists, began his class on Jewish politics with the Va'ad, the Council of Four Lands, which was the supreme elected body for Polish Jewry in Old Poland before the partitions. It consisted of delegates of the major communities in the four regions of the country. And it, it was an authoritative voice in matters of, of, of tax distribution, but also many, many other ways. So there was no Jewish state, but there was Jewish politics. And that was the most advanced form of Jewish autonomy between ancient Israel and 1948 again. So we have the biggest community with the most advanced form of Jewish autonomy in, in history between antiquity and the 20th century. And, it, and, and it's gone. With the partition, it's gone. And then Polish Jews are just individuals facing the absolutist monarchies of Russia, Austria, and Prussia. So here you have the Tsarine Katrina, Joseph II of Prussia, and Friedrich of, of, of Prussia. And through the 19th century, we follow the story of Jewish emancipation and the debates about emancipation. Uh, uh, it was difficult for me to show it. We also have a railway station. 
Why a railway station in the Jewish Museum? For several reasons. For us, as a symbol of modernity, of the dramatic change brought by the new technologies, industrialization, urbanization. And incidentally, railroads in Poland were built by three Jewish business people. Actually, uh, uh, one of them, um, Kronenberg, was a convert. Uh, but he was the richest man in the country and um, um, a great philanthropist who founded parallelly Jewish and Christian hospitals to the end of, of his life. And this way we move to interwar Poland. We have Poland again after 1918. And this is what we call the Jewish street. What you see are projections. The walls are white. There is a dozen of uh, overhead projections that screen pictures and we can change them uh, on these walls. And incidentally, the street which you see here is six meters beneath Zamenhofa Street as it was up to 1943. It's exactly in this line. And here we show the cultural, line of Polish, cultural life of Polish Jews and the political life of Polish Jews. This is about the politics. You can see uh, the spectrum of Jewish parties from the Bundes on the left, Agudas Israel, the mainstream religious party, to the Zionist, or, well, Prolo Zionist, many Zionist parties on the right. Uh, you, know, you know, to Menachem Begin uh, uh, and other. My favorite exhibit is uh, this paper of this size, which was distributed by the Polish Ministry of Administration, local administrator. It was a brief description of the major Jewish party's position of most important issues in a very small print. So, which explains the old joke that two Polish Jews made three political parties. Actually, they made more than three at that time. But this is a proof of how vibrant was the social, cultural, and political life at that time. Interwar Poland was not the best place for individual Jew, but it proved, it offered conditions for a development of Jewish communal life, also in response to the rising tide of anti-Semitism in the 1930s. And then we move to the next gallery, the Holocaust gallery. But what we, one of the uh, ambitions and challenges of the, of, of, of the curators was to make the visitors suspend their knowledge of what happened between 1939 and 1945, not to project back the shadow of the Holocaust. Because there is an unhealthy tendency, unhealthy for, for any historian, to believe that the Jewish history was somehow predetermined that it had to end in the Holocaust, not it didn't have to end in the Holocaust. The Holocaust was a consequence of a definition of a group of men in Berlin. It was not determined in 1920, not in 1560, nor in 12th century, certainly not. And then we also try to convey a feeling of surprise and the shock of this war, uh, which is a major experience of the prisoners of the, of, of the ghetto. But we start with the German policies in occupied Poland. You can see humiliation, labeling, and so on. But I would like to show you something very small, which shows how reflective and how pre-reflected is the core exhibition. Here you have very small photographs, really small. And uh, you have a bigger drawing showing what is on the photograph. And I approach Jacek Leoczak, Professor Jacek Leoczak, who is a historian for this. Jacek, why did you put such a small photograph? I can see nothing. I must bow down to, to see anything. And he said to me, this is exactly for you to bow down. Because the man on this photograph, you can see a photograph taken by German soldiers other German soldiers cutting beards of a Jew in a small Polish town, September 1939. This man was humiliated twice, when a German soldier cut his beard, and when he had to pose for a photograph in front of another German soldier. I don't want you to humiliate him for the third time. You must bow to see this picture. And every time, especially for the, uh, for the German occupation, most of the photographs from the uh, German occupation were, were taken by, by, by the Germans, by the perpetrators. And camera is not innocent. The camera was in the hand of the perpetrators. I mean, we always stated there is no such thing as a neutral eye of the camera. The camera always, there is a man behind the camera all the time. And here the section ends, well, it's not clearly visible, with the list of 600 ghettos. We make research exit poll among our visitors. What do they remember? And it's very often this message. Even Poles from Poland who knew, well, the, the Holocaust happened in, in their towns, well, in, in front of the eyes of their grandparents. Many of them are unaware. They know about the big ghettos, Warsaw, Łódź, Kraków, but they very often do not know that there were 600 of them all around Poland. Uh, we move across the Warsaw ghetto, and it's difficult to show in a photograph because deliberately the space in this part of, the, of our core exhibition is becoming oppressive. 
while the Paradisus Iodorum of the, or the Stadt galleries are wide, colorful, full of light. It's pleasant to be there. The Holos gallery, the space is oppressive. It's small, walls are curved, they are narrow, and it's deliberate. It's been also made to feel lost. During the production of the core exhibition, uh, for the first two weeks I was, I was getting lost in it, despite the fact I knew it very well. So it, it shows how effective the, the, the scenography was. And one of the things that we are trying to show in this is the separation between the prisoners of the ghettos and the people outside, between the, the ghetto and so-called Aryan and the Aryan street. And we use Warsaw Ghetto as pars pro toto. We tell the history of the Warsaw Ghetto as an example. And here, this is the view from the Aryan street. And you can see down uh, up there a wooden path bridge above Chłodna Street, which connected two parts of the ghetto. So this is what people from outside, the Christian Post, could see. They, if, when there are visitors, you can see other visitors standing there. And these visitors up there watch the visitors down, downstairs. And there's an incredible feeling of alienation, of distance, which was exactly the experience of the Jews closed behind the, the ghetto walls, that they live in a separate world. And it was also the experience of people outside that the Jews became abstract after two years of, of isolation. And here we also tell what the Jews could not see. Here, for example, this is the structure of the Polish underground in occupied Poland. You cannot see it from the bridge. You must go down, come here, because it was hidden. On the right wall, which you cannot see, you see German posters about that, uh, that anyone offering any assistance to the Jews will be punished by death. And here we show you can sit to see the, the pictures and also listen to the fragments from the diaries of non-Jewish Poles during the war, what they knew about the fate of the Jews and what they thought about it. And you have very diverse uh, points of view on this topic. And the next section is about Jews in hiding, but this is almost impossible to show. It's a very black room. And only then, in the next section, we move outside of Poland. We show that the Holocaust was not just a, a German policy in occupied Poland, but that was a continental, continent-wide genocide. So we show the Villa of Van Ze, the conference when they decided upon logistics of deportation of Jews from all the countries to the killing centers in Poland. But on the right hand, you see these white uh, trees, uh, uh, Holocaust by ballots. Several hundred thousand Jews before the gas chambers began operation were killed by the execution squads and the local collaborators in the spring, uh, uh, summer and fall of 1941. Uh, and here, this way, we leave the, the Holocaust gallery and it's not the end of the story. That means the Holocaust is not the last gallery. There is the post-war gallery. And this post-war gallery starts with the ruins. 90% uh, of Polish Jews perish in the Holocaust. And we show it, we have a huge wall full of replicas of registration cards. Jewish committees after the war registered Jewish survivors so they could find families and friends. And you have a huge wall of these registration cards and only 10% of them are filled with names. 90% are empty. There were no people to fill them. And this way, not textually, but by methods proper for an exhibition, we conveyed the message almost total destruction. But that was almost total. This 10% of Polish Jews was more than 300,000. So it was first of sec or second largest Jewish community in Europe outside of the Soviet Union at that time, of the size of the French Jewish community, which is now the biggest Jewish community in Europe. So Polish Jewry was almost killed, almost destroyed, but it survived. Uh, and then in the post-war gallery, we tell the story of basically of attempts to rebuild Jewish life or emigrate. And this is the main dilemma in the post-war gallery. On the right hand, we show arguments for living. On the left hand, arguments to stay and what those Jews who stayed did. And uh, here you can see arguments for living. First, that Poland was a very dangerous country. It was a country in a state of civil war between the communists and the, and the anti-communist resistance, of high banditry. Uh, uh, um, firearms available to anyone, but the Jews, for Jews, life was more risky than for others. Namely, when we take proportion of Jews killed after the war to the small Jewish population, uh, the probability of being killed as a Jew was greater than, than as a non-Jew. That means some people were killed as Jews. And here we show the, the, uh, the most infamous case of it, the pogrom of Kielce. Uh, what you see here, the smiling young people, are members of kibbutz, 
In 1945, they prepare for emigration to Palestine. They stand in front of the building at Plante Street. Next year, in 1946, there was a pogrom with 42 uh, people killed, the, 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 the most deadly pogrom in, in post-war Poland. And we tell the story on the other side of this, of, this, of this picture. We tell the story in a very special way. We quote three sources. One is the official Communist Party newspaper saying that this is reactionary forces are trying to undermine the people's democracy and so on. The second is an underground newspaper, anti-communist, saying that this is a Soviet um, uh, provocation to conceal the manipulation of the, of the plebiscite that had taken place a few days before. And then we had a letter of the Bishop of Kielce to the American ambassador, which basically says, well, we condemn these horrible crimes, but you know, the Jews cooperate with the communists, which means you know, they deserve what they got. And we leave the visitor with the sources. We don't give a judgment. We leave the opinion to the visitors. We believe that visitors are, are capable of judging by themselves. And this we continue. Uh, uh, this is a part of restoration of Jewish life, the commemoration of the Holocaust. What you see here, this is the Rappaport Monument standing in front of the museum. This is Warsaw in 1948. Okay. Uh, another important moment, the emergence of the State of Israel and how does it change the perception in Poland. Now, Polish Jews do not emigrate to British Palestine or to another country. They can emigrate to a state of their own and that makes a difference. And also the state has initially very good relations with communist Poland, which allowed for the wave of emigration. Uh, but also, you have Jewish life destroyed. In Silesia, most of Polish Jewish survivors, by the way, they survived the war in the Soviet Union. And again, most of them had been lucky to be victims of the Soviet persecution, being deported to Kazakhstan or Siberia, which means far away from the Nazis. So they returned to Poland after the war and they rebuilt Jewish life. So you can see uh, elementary school with the Yiddish as the language of instruction. In some of the small towns in Lower Silesia, which is the territory taken from Germany after the war, Jews made 30%, sometimes 50% of the, of the population, like in Jerzhony. And here we show something specific of, of the communist period. Uh, this, is, this wall in, in, in the middle is the Venetian glass. It separates two uh, community centers that belong to the Jewish Cultural Social Association, TSKZ, the only legal Jewish organization in communist Poland at that time. On your left side, you can see this room in the Stalin era. So you can see the heroes, posters that the Soviet Union is a friend of all the children in the world. You can see film from show trials in Poland, but also in Czechoslovakia, the infamous Slansky show trial where most of the defendants were Jewish, but also show trials of Polish patriots who were executed at that time by the communist regime. On the right, you see the same place after 56 and in the 1960s. There is no longer Stalin in the room. Heroes are different. You have television and you have youth culture coming from the West. Uh, um, rock groups, early rock groups, and what, what happens to the Jewish community in this long process of acculturation. But at that time, Polish Jewish community is not bigger than 30,000 people. So only 10% of the original 300,000 remains. Why? Because others emigrated. In several ways of immigration, mostly to Israel at that time, they left Poland. Uh, for reasons I, I can explain afterwards. This is this, the, the, the biggest of this wave in 1956-58. And here we come to what seems to be the final state of the Polish Jewish history in 1968, the so-called anti-Zionist campaign, which was just an anti-Jewish campaign. It began as an anti-Israeli one, where the, Jewish, where the last wave of Jewish emigration, small one, less than 14,000 people emigrated. And after what, it seems it's over. The last remaining Jews will die out. We show, sorry, not here. We show photographs from an album published in the West back in the 1980s, and the title was "The Last Jews of Poland." And when I began my research in 1988, preparing my dissertation on on a Polish Jewish politician during the Holocaust, I, I thought that was like like a postscript to the history of Polish Jews, and I was wrong. Like many people, I was wrong, because the last gallery or section of our core exhibition revival of Jewish life in Poland after 1989, which is another miracle. The revival is a miracle 
And uh, the interest of the non-Jewish Poles in Jewish history is a parallel, parallel miracle, which made the museum possible. And this last exhibit are interviews with Polish Jews today, I mean eight months ago, last year, and they answer a basic question, what does it mean to be Jewish in Poland today? Is there anti-Semitism? What do you think of Israel? Who makes Jewish culture? And they answer, which means that five or ten years from now we'll have to change them, because this is an ongoing history. There are new institutions, new ideas, young people, and they may have different opinions. And this is, for the time being, the end of our exhibition. Since we have opened on October 28th, so in the five months, uh, sorry, this is for the late March. Now it's 140,000 already visitors, and you can see sometimes it's quite crowded. Uh, and so it's how it looks now in the spring of 2015. Thank you very much. I can speak to this. But maybe you want to walk and okay. close the paper. So you need to turn it on. Okay. Uh, Professor Stoller will take questions now. I would ask you, please, we have two microphones to raise your hands and make a sign to one of the two people on each side. And we would be very grateful if you would uh, not enter into long monologues. Uh, ask your question or make your comment as briefly as possible so that we can make as many questions as possible. Does that work? Do you want to test it? Do you hear me? No, try not. Just. Okay. No? Okay. I'm wired. Yes. Is it true that your government records everything? <laughs> this is what they say in Europe. Okay. Please. Yes, please. Um, you mentioned that Jim uh, is also a source of education in Poland. Can you expound more about what are the, some of the programs that are being used um, in schools in Poland and what ages and what schools, whether, you know, what, what is being done to educate the Polish students about um, how Jews uh, participated over the thousand years in creating Poland and making it what it is today. So first, we are not going to, uh, to substitute for the Ministry of Education. Uh, the Ministry of Education, it has its own guidelines for all the public schools in Poland. So for example, I, I am an author of a textbook for secondary schools on 20th century history. So, uh, and this textbook had to meet certain requirements, and one of the requirements that I had to cover, uh, not just specifically by ethnic minorities in interwar Poland, and specifically the Holocaust as a separate chapter for the war period. So this is what kids have in all the schools. But what we add to this, we have programs that are voluntary. We invite the schools to come, and uh, our key audience are secondary schools, which means kids between uh, 13 and 18. Uh, and we do museum classes at the museum, so which makes a part of the 400,000 visitors before we have opened. Uh, but also we reach out, and we have two extremely successful reach out programs. On the week of our grand opening, the opening of the core exhibition, we've made an online class. We have hired two very popular young actors who were speakers for this lesson. It was a you know, one hour uh, very short history of Polish Jews. And we've made it available online, but classes had to log in because there was a, an, an interactive part of it. And what my target was to have 50,000 participants. I, I couldn't dream about anything more than that. We had 400,000 participants. Uh, 17,000 teachers all around Poland logged in their classes, and the average class is about 25 people, 30 people. And so when you combine 17,000 by 25, that makes 400,000 people voluntarily. They want to know it. Another example is we have a mobile exhibition, the Museum on Wheels, which is uh, two standard shipping containers which we can assemble shortly in a small building. It travels only from one small town to another, for two reasons, small towns. First, because these small towns had 30%, 50%, sometimes even more percent Jewish population up to the Second World War. And second, that in such a small town, we are very, very welcome. 
our exhibition is usually the most, the biggest cultural event in the town in, in a given year. So they want us to come. Last year it visited 21 towns, this year it will visit 22. We make it on a competitive basis, namely that if a local government wants us to come, they must offer something, which is an educational program, uh, clearing the Jewish cemetery, erecting a monument, they must do something. And this is extremely successful. I have a collection of 350 press clippings from local newspapers, you know, county level newspapers. They are really small towns. And in one small town in Izbica Kuyavska, which I've never heard of before, uh, every third inhabitant visited the exhibition. So we not only try to, to, to teach this history, but we feel that people want to know it. And in the small towns they want to know it because they believe it's a part of their town history. Um, uh, but we, we don't focus only on, 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 on teenagers, although for us it's the most important group. We also have uh, workshops for, uh, in kind of a continuing education and not on, on history. So for example, last year we had workshops for police officers on uh, racism and neo-fascism. Some police officers in the northern, in Białystok, northeastern Poland, had some problems in recognizing the, the Nazi salute and we had to, to explain to them. You know, because in Poland it's, it's a crime. In Poland, it's, it's, it's criminalized. Uh, we, we had workshops for the journalists about the hate speech. So there are very contemporary topics that we can refer to a specific history, such as the, you know, the expansion of the fascist movement back into the 1930s and what are the consequences. Uh, so this is, this is about education, but the most important teaching instrument is the core exhibition. Thank you. Uh, the, And there is a gentleman here who also wants a microphone. Yes. Well, congratulations. It looks like a great museum. But I, I just wonder... Polish Jewry had an incredible culture, artistically, um, as, uh, not a ceremonial object. There were goldsmiths, there were carpet makers, there were textile industry. Um, there were painters, Jewish painters say throughout, there was theater. Uh, I, I haven't seen one uh, Jewish object in, the, in this entire presentation. So I just wonder how, uh, you know, this creativity and, and, and artistic expression of Polish Jewry is being uh, exhibited. Of course it's there. We have uh, more than 200 original objects, artifacts, uh, uh, but we want to have more of them. The museum is a new institution. You build collections for many years. Other, uh, other major Jewish museums in Europe, like the Paris Museum or the Berlin Museum, they had large collections, pre-existing collections. We have started from scratch, from nothing. So everything that we have, we have collected in the past 10 years usually thanks to generous donations of some goodwill people, or we have them on lease from other museums. So we want to expand on it, but you will find quite a number of, of really distinguished, especially for the painters in the 19th and 20th century, but we also go in the popular art, um, in, the, in the interwar period, and uh, I think the most recent painting is from the 1960s, from Nacht Samborski, uh, which is again uh, we, we, have, we have shown a, a, a painting by Nacht Samborski because of, of, of his art, but also because of his biography. Uh, you have this double name, Nacht Samborski. Samborski is the name he took during the war, uh, you know, using Aryan papers to hide. And after the war, he wasn't sure he would like to return to his pre-war Jewish identity. After years of hesitation, he decided to keep both of them as Nacht Samborski. I think of a very important cultural process of kind of a polyvalent identity which eventually is not exclusive, that you, could, you, you have it both. But uh, 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 there is it, uh, there is a, a lot of Jewish art, uh, uh, not from the medieval period. From the medieval period we have only two kinds of objects, coins and tombstones. We don't have a tombstone, but we have coins, and this is the oldest exhibit that we have, uh, which by the way, uh, if you have a 10 zloty bill, uh, anyone from Poland? No? <laughs> uh, uh, so if visitors learn only in our museum that the very early coins in Poland have inscriptions in Hebrew. So we have a coin where the name of the prince, Prince Mieszko, is written with Hebrew letters. Why? 
because the first mentors were Jewish. And the, the prince was probably illiterate, so for him it didn't matter what's the alphabet. <laughs> he couldn't read. So they did it in, they did it in Hebrew. Yes, please. There were um, Polish people during the war that risked their life to save uh, Jewish children and Jewish people. Do you have anything to, on this topic in the museum? And the second question, you had many collaborators in Poland who, and this was mentioned by the director of the FBI last week in the Washington Post, that uh, collaborated with the Germans. So you have these two extremes. And the question is, do you have anything about that in the museum? Okay, so of course we show, there is this section on hiding outside of ghettos, where the, we show the organized assistance to the Jews. And there were two organizations that did it, Zegota, which was the only non-Jewish organization to help the Jews, which was affiliated with the Polish underground state and financed by the Polish underground state. So we, we show three leaders of it from Warsaw, Krakow, and Lwów. And also the Jewish National Committee, which was a political representation, but it also distributed funds after the, the ghetto uprising to others. And in another place, uh, we have uh, a late uh, Mrs. Uh, Sendler gave us her medal of the righteous among the nations, uh, given by the, by the Yad Vashem, the Israeli authority. And we have, we, we have this copy on display in our information center with the story of who was Mrs. Sandler, that she saved many children, of course not alone, she was a part of this organization. Uh, so this is, this is our way of showing the story. Speaking about the collaborators, I think it was very unfortunate what the, the, the director of FBI said, because it's him, she doesn't recognize allies from enemies. Uh, uh, Hungary was an ally of Germany, Poland was an occupied state. And that, while there was individual collaborators in Poland, there was never organized collaboration. And actually, Poland is the government which was fighting against Nazi Germany since the first day of war to the last day of war, uh, which is certainly not a rule in, in Europe. So uh, uh, we show collaborators uh, as much uh, as, uh, but when people ask me, do you show Polish anti-Semites? Uh, my answer is, this is not a museum of anti-Semites. If anti-Semites want to have a museum, they must do their own fundraising. Uh, we, we show them to, only to the extent when anti-Semitism was a factor of Jewish life and sometimes of Jewish death. So for example, of course, we show the wave of pogroms in 1941, in summer of 1941, with two cases, the case of Yedwabne and the case of Lviv, Lviv uh, in, in July. Yes, please. It sounds like an amazing project. I'm happy that in two weeks we'll be in Warsaw and we'll definitely be there. And I'm really curious about, I know you're a scholar, what made you or how did you become so involved in this project? Well, yes, I am a scholar. When I took this position, I have reached the highest level of my incompetence. <laughs> uh, but some 27 years ago, I began researching Polish-Jewish history. I wrote two books on it. Uh, although I, the past 10 years I spent working on communist Poland mostly. Uh, in Israel, Israel Gutman, a great late Israeli scholar of, 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 of Polish Jewry, once said that he got to the topic and the topic got to him. And I simply believe this is a great project. It's, it's good and right to make it. And it's such a pleasure, the company of people who support and make the museum. Uh, it, this is an incredible group of people. Really, it's such a honor to work with them. I cannot imagine any, any better job for, for a historian than working in this museum. Um, if, if an American Jewish uh, student from the University of Michigan uh, is able to come and visit Poland and uh, come to the museum, what's the best way for her to uh, approach the museum and get the most out of it? Are there, are there custom tours or are there uh, uh, particular focuses or do you make arrangements ahead of time? What's the best way to go about it? Okay, first, allocate a lot of time. 
<laughs> because the biggest mistake that visitors do, they don't have enough time. And uh, uh, at the beginning, we have a, a number of visitors who have visited only the first three galleries. And they were exhausted, and they left thinking that they have seen all of it. Uh, so, uh, several hours. And we have a nice cafeteria, so one can take a coffee or a lunch. With very decent prices. Uh, the exhibition is made to be self-explanatory, which means you can visit it without any guide. We have docents in every room. All of them speak English, very nice people. Uh, you, can, you can hire a guide. You can take an audio guide in one of the seven languages that we have. Uh, we distribute uh, you know, a, a mini guide, kind of a very short instruction with maps and highlights of it. But this is targeted to people who have, let's say, up to two hours. Uh, I know people who have visited the museum several times. Uh, in this country, I have met a person who spent totally 26 hours. And she told me she knows probably 30% of the content, which is, I think, it's true. Because we have put so much in the multimedia, for example, in the synagogue, when you try to learn what is the inscription on, on, on a ceiling, you can read it, then you can read what is the meaning of the elephant, and what the elephant says on this wall, and what is the minion, and, and then you go deeper and deeper and deeper, and in total, in the multimedia, we have some 8,000 pages of text and images, which is like a big encyclopedia. Uh, so allow time, and then follow your interest. Because there is no dominant narrative. We don't say there is only one canonical story of the history of Polish Jews. No. There are many of them. And depending on personal interest or even aesthetic um, interest, you can decide for, let's say, the history of, of Judaism in Poland, or women, or the radical movement, or, or, or Jews in business, or why Jewish ta tavern keeper made Polish peasant an alcoholic which is a topic which I have to explain sometime. And you are guilty, Americans are guilty of this. Uh, this is true, I can explain in a second. So there are many ways, uh, but if, you, if a student from Michigan University wants to come, I propose to come in a group of students. Meet with me, have a curatorial guided tour, meet with the historians who are our friends, and then the value added of a visit will, will be much greater and I will welcome them. So I think this is, this is the best way uh, to make it. And I think this is the best way to end the lecture.